Ryan and I met uh, a little over, oh, about a year ago now, actually, in Napa. And he shared some really sad and shocking statistics with me. And so I don't know if those stats have been updated, uh, hopefully in a good way, but tell everybody a little bit about the Alliance first off and how it started. And uh, you guys just celebrated your year anniversary. Talk to us about membership, what it looks like. Uh, there's a Chicago chapter. Talk to us a little bit about that first. And, and yeah. Well, thank you for the opportunity, obviously. Happy belated Mother's Day to any mothers that are here. Um, I'm not running for office, I just think that's important. Um, the Alliance was started in, actually on Father's Day uh, of 2020. And at that point in time, if you would have asked me if, if I wanted the opportunity to start a minority-owned nonprofit in real estate during a pandemic, I would have bolted the other direction. It's not something that was on my radar. It's not something that was on my list, nor was it something that was on my bucket list. Um, I just happened to have had the right skill set to engage in it. Unfortunately, there was a, a previous organization that held the footprint that we now occupy in the real estate industry in North America. That organization went through some severe financial and ethical mismanagement and was since stripped of all of its titles uh, and there's federal investigation ongoing. I was a part of that organization for seven years. I was very proud to have been a part of that organization. Unfortunately, there was a lot going on behind the scenes that the, the leadership team just didn't know anything about. And when members started digging and then Inman started digging, um, the very, very graphic details were exposed and. I like to say you can get the Bravo TV account through reading Inman articles that have been published over the last year. Um, but the fact of the matter remains is that there was a vacancy now in real estate and finance in North America where the LGBTQ community once had representation that no longer exists. And there was an immediate call to action from the National Association of Realtors Canadian Real Estate Association and many of the brands that you all work for or represent uh, throughout North America to fill that void. So we reorganized almost immediately. We took 56 chapter presidents from that organization, the full board of directors, the full staff, and a lot of the membership rolled over and created the Alliance. The Alliance is not meant to be a duplicate of the former organization. We want to be an independently thought of organization. We're a 501c6, so just like your associations, um, with full transparency and elected hierarchy of governance and oversight. Um, we solicit fundraising and sponsorships just like your, uh, your nonprofits do your chambers of commerce and stuff. Um, but we represent the interests of the LGBTQ plus and allied communities in all things real estate and finance. So our seat at the table, we jokingly call ourselves one of the four families, and I made the reference at the lunch table. It's a very Don Corleone kind of thing. Um, but we are one of the four diverse segment organizations recognized um, with the Canadian Association, the National Association, and the Mexican Real Estate Association um, representing diverse segments. It's the Alliance, NAREB, which is the African American Black Association, NAREP, which is the Hispanic Latino, Association and ARIA, the Asian American Pacific Islander Association. So we're very delighted to be at the table. Um, NAR has given us a full welcome and we are we have a voice now in process. Um, some of the facts that Michael has cited have actually gone the other direction and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, but we're, we're very pleased to be on the scene. It's wonderful to have an opportunity to share uh, what we do with other folks, to be real honest with you, because there is a need and that fundamental need for representation exists in every community. Whether you're a woman or a person of color, or you come from a different diverse background with ability or disability, representation matters. And if clients don't see folks being represented in real estate, they're probably going to shy away from the process and we have just created perpetual renters. That's not what we're here to do. I truly believe that home ownership is the American dream. And if that's the truth, everyone's entitled to it, or at least entitled to seeking it. If we're not properly representing the communities we serve, how are we going to be effective in doing that? 
It's one of many questions that we aim to solve at the Alliance through working through our segment. I want to re-emphasize the ally portion of what I just said because 22% of the members at the Alliance identify as straight allies. There is no minority movement that has achieved civil rights justice without support from supporting communities. Allies are significantly important to what we do at the Alliance. Otherwise, we're just a choir singing to itself. Why do I say all this? The LGBTQ community does not have any federal protection in America today. It was not included in the Equal Rights Amendment. It was not included in the Fair Housing Act. And it was not included in any aspect of financial reform. In 29 states today, it is legal for a seller to tear up a purchase contract at the closing table for no other reason than the fact that they don't want to sell to a gay couple. It is legal for a landlord to evict a renter for the fact that they are a trans individual. It is legal to be denied shelter or for a mortgage lender, despite regulations, to charge six points higher on an interest rate if they find out that I'm gay and they don't like it. There are no protections in 29 states prohibiting that. The other states have state level protections. These are, and again, without diving into politics, traditionally bluer states. And the folks that live in those states take it for granted and just assume that it's the law of the land. I come from Minnesota, a very blue state. California is the same way. Folks that I talk to in my state don't understand that the privilege that we have in Minnesota is not extended across the country. So these are all things that we look at addressing and remedying at the Alliance. And we worked very closely with our partners in the, the other three families um, because the cool thing, the opportunity that we have at the Alliance is to consider that the LGBTQ community is composed of the fabric of humanity. It's not just one group of people. It is many groups of people under a multiplex of identities. So we have every religious creed and, and context. We have every political mindset and view, every ethnicity and race, veteran or military status, civilian status. All of these folks make up our community. So <laughs> it's often challenging as a white gay man representing a very diverse group of people to get on stage and talk about how much we need when inherently I recognize that I'm probably at, at the better off end of, of my own community. Um, we talk about housing, and, and Michael and I will talk about this too. We have a lot of work to do as far as home ownership rates in this country, and NAR is helping with that, but it really comes down to this level, to agent conversations, because you all are your community ambassadors. You're the ones that literally and figuratively hold open the doors for other people to come into the houses in the neighborhoods. And the more information that we do from an administrative level and passing on to you, hopefully the more successful you will become at what you're trying to do. There's a huge financial benefit outside of the more moral and ethical imperative that I believe exists as well. And we'll talk about what that financial benefit looks like also. 29 states. I mean, that's more than it was a year ago. Yeah. I think it was 26 or seven. Yeah. So it's going the wrong way. There are currently 300 pieces of legislation circulating state houses to either eliminate or completely restrict rights for LGBTQ folks. What you all saw very publicly in the Battle of Florida, as we call it, where Governor DeSantis decided to take on Mickey Mouse, is being replicated in 12 states. You're just not hearing about it. Um, 300 different pieces of legislation in state houses. So it's real, and, and I'm certainly not here, and I'm not interested in getting into the discussion on, on what the Supreme Court is hearing right now. Um, but I will tell you that, that that verdict will set a precedent because the challenge coming out of Florida on, on that ruling is based on the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was also used to extend the privilege of same-sex marriage to Jim Obergefell when he took on the Supreme Court and we got marriage equality. So logic stems that if Roe v. Wade is overturned, that same-sex marriage will also be overturned again. Um, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, and, and the reality is, is that we need folks to stand with us and support us and it's impossible for us on our own the lgbtq community in america represents 12 percent of all single family home purchases every year 
that number just continues to rise. The more privilege, the more benefits that are legally enacted on our community, the higher those numbers go. So now that we can legally marry, guess what comes next? We're having kids and we're moving to the suburbs because that square foot loft, it's not conducive to raising a family, especially when you're locked in there during a pandemic. So we're moving into the suburbs and we're looking to be welcomed into neighborhoods with higher price points. Um, none of this can happen if we don't have the fundamental rights to pursue home ownership and build generational wealth. You know, one of the things I, I really admire about Ryan and I support him and his organization, what he's doing, but, and I had that respect and support for you before what I'm about to say, but uh, in January of this year, so about four months ago, uh, we hadn't caught up a little bit, so we're catching up. And he, uh, he called me, and, or I called him, we were catching up, and about eight weeks previous to this, I spoke at a school board meeting. You, you know what, you can probably Google me, but I was, I, I advocated for my kids for mask optional. I know this is very controversial. I'm not saying what he's right or not. For me personally, I wanted, my kids mental and physical and my daughter was speech delayed i thought it was we had enough data out there that should have the option to take the mask off so i spoke at a school board meeting about that but there was also a book that was very controversial in the elementary school and it was controversial for a couple of reasons one it was lgbtq but on my sense it was controversial because it was sexuality based and in my case, I personally, my fourth grade daughter, I'd rather have conversations of all sexuality at the house. So Ryan got two anonymous emails uh, that um, one of your members spoke up against LGBTQ and the, the interview is public. I told Ryan this, I told Ryan exactly what happened. I said, and I said, this is not anti-LGBTQ. This is, I'm just think sexuality at the elementary school. My point is, and he even said, there's a good chance, Michael, you and I vote differently and we don't agree in a lot of things. But he came from a place of understanding, gave me the benefit of the doubt. I, of course, have done the same. And, and I think that's the fabric of America. A lot of my videos, I'll say, turn off the news. They want to separate you. They want to label you and me. They want to label him and I. I, I we probably do vote differently, okay? But I love him. I don't see, I, I see a human being, a heart. I, I, I don't care. I don't judge, and I can say he didn't the same. He gave, he extended that benefit to me. In today's day and age where I called cancel culture, he could have just said bye. He didn't put it top of a, a high priority because he knew he would talk to me eventually. And I just want to publicly you know, thank you because maybe you should go for politics because I think we need that more in the political state world too. Love thy neighbor and not just love thy neighbor if they vote the same way as you. And so I, I want to publicly uh, thank you uh, for extending me grace and at least hear my side of it uh, because of the emails that you got. I'd expect. <laughs> So, so a couple of things to that point. First of all, I have absolutely no time for anonymous emails. If you're not gonna have the courage to put your name on something, I don't wanna hear it. If you're not gonna be in the rodeo, riding the horses, and you're gonna be hollering from the stands, I don't wanna hear it. So uh, it was something, however, that I did want to address because you're more conservative than I am socially, but I also respect the hell out of you with what you've done because you not only see that, that moral, and emotional need to work with diverse segments, you see the great business opportunity that it presents, which as producing agents in this room, everyone needs to understand the future of your business is coming from diverse segments and Generation Z. And we'll talk about that too, because it's so important to realize that your traditional demographic for the last 50 years, man, they've already retired and bought their cabin. They're not buying anything else, sorry. It's time to change the way we do business inherently. Michael gave me the opportunity in Napa to get in front of my first crowd of luxury agents um, and have some real conversation comparable to this. 
And it was incredible how many people came up to me afterwards, and I'm not encouraging this here. Granted, this was at a vineyard and there was wine involved. Um, There'll be wine later, but probably not the same as Napa wine. How know. many mothers and fathers came up to me uh, just in tears and gave me the biggest hug. And this was still like there was COVID going around. So I was like, okay, maybe hug my shoulder. Uh, <laughs> and just shared that their child or their niece or their nephew or when you put something into context that folks can relate to it turns from a news bulletin into a personal item and that's what we try and do and i think that's what all of our segments try and do um, just real quick because they're not represent well not all the segments are represented 73 percent of all purchases over the next 10 years are going to come from the latino community if you don't know fundamental spanish you're going to miss out and I know it's not convenient for any of us to learn a second language late in life, but it's opportunity. The black home ownership rate, which was supposed to skyrocket after the Fair Housing Act, has actually decreased by 2% since that act was put in place. It did not solve the problem. The problem still exists. The Asian home ownership rate in America is sharply declining, especially over the last five years with the political climate that we see. These segments need help. These segments need attention and they're not going to get fixed or solution for without a collaboration of folks talking about it. The LGBTQ home ownership rate in this country is 49%. The average home ownership rate in this country is 65%. The cisgender, and we'll talk about that word in a second, cisgender white home ownership rate in this country is 74%. There are some discrepancies there. Cisgender means that you identify with the sex that you were born in, by the way, um, if some of you hear that. We have work to do, because when you get into the intersectionality, which means the complexity, the ver various different identities that compose a community, the intersectionality of the LGBTQ population, the black LGBTQ population's home ownership rate is 13%. The Asian LGBTQ population's home ownership rate is 7%. These are the two lowest home ownership rate percentages in America today. 45% of all homeless youth under the age of 25% identify as LGBTQ in America today. Uh, uh, one more time, yeah, D under 25. Wait, 45% of homeless youth. Homeless youth. 45% of all homeless youth on the streets today in America identify as LGBTQ+. That's a crisis in itself that we don't talk about. States and veteran others, I can tell you that a lot of folks that are homeless tend to go south because they can live on the street year round. And if you've been in the south in the last two years, I was in Miami Beach looking at a property for one of our conventions and I was floored with what Miami Beach looked like 10 years ago and looks like today. That's a societal problem that we're not talking about and we're all housing professionals. Even within this room, I'm convinced that there's enough collective know-how to figure out this problem we're just not talking about. Talk, talk to me about some of the statistics. You said uh, in Napa, you had people come up to you and say, oh, thank you. One in what, yeah, like you shared a statistic in Napa that talked about how one in every blank or yeah. chances are in your family, yeah. you know, to talk to us a little bit about that. Please. Yeah, so Gallup just updated a poll, um, the 2021 poll that Gallup did on generational breakdowns of how many folks are out in the LGBTQ community. At the far end, the traditionalist generation, those who are, are 70 plus, it's less than 1%. 24% of Gen Z identify as LGBTQ plus. It's a lot of your kids, if you have kids, or your kids' friends. So if you take that statistic and you couple it with what the census and the Williams Institute at UCLA just put out, estimate about 3.1 people per household in America today. Now, 1% is like when you cut people in half and put half here. Um, if you're estimating that, and then according to Williams Institute, about 10% of the population today identify as LGBTQ+. That means one in every three households in America has someone who identifies as LGBTQ, whether they're out or not. So how does that apply to you in context? 
Well, that means it's your house, your neighbor to your left, or your neighbor to the right. Someone in your immediate vicinity is impacted by this. You say 10% of the population, it doesn't sound like a lot, but one in every three houses could be yours. Um, that means that these issues aren't just some kind of special interest issues. These are American issues that are, are being called to question right now. I started out the training today uh, <coughs> talking about NAREB, ARIA, LGBTQ Alliance, NAREB, and there's a lot of reasons you should be joining from a, these organizations need membership from not just get the word out, but also financially. Talk to us a little bit about the initiatives. You were just in Washington uh, and, and how you, your organization helps with these 29 states yeah. raise, raise awareness. Yeah. And I'll say, you know, I think our focus is on the other states that, that need the help. Um, okay. So the, tw the, the, the 21 states, giving them additional exactly. support. So we have, we have four pillars at the Alliance. Advocacy, which is right now forefront. Philanthropy, education, and business development for professional ROI. Just like a gym, probably a lot of our gym memberships over the last two years, if you're not using it, you're not gonna renew it, right? So we wanna make sure that our members are getting something out of their investment. Our, by investment, it's uh, retail, $200 a year for membership. If you ever pay full price, you're doing something wrong because there's 92 discount codes floating around out there. I think we got a discount got phone. Yeah. You guys got one in your bags. It's like Oprah and you've got one and you've got one. Um, 150 bucks for your first year. It comes with a directory listing. We're the only minority trade organization that actually has a collaborative directory that is consumer facing, where folks can go in there and look for an agent, a member of the Alliance to work with in any given geography in 32 different professions. So not just a realtor, maybe they're looking for a CPA, maybe they're looking for a photographer or an inspector, a mortgage professional or title. We have 32 different professions in our ranks and we offer that to the public as a resource to make sure that if there's a gay couple moving from San Francisco to Kentucky and they wanna work with an LGBTQ plus or allied agent to make sure that their experience in that move is unbiased, they can go to our directory and find that person and reach out directly. Our referral network is incredibly robust and I'd say that we probably do about $105 million a year in referral business just between our networks alone. So not everyone gets a referral every year, but we advertise the five year average, which we're not even five years old, but just based on where we're trending, um, you'll probably pop out five referrals, just peer to peer, not consumer facing um, over that time. So it'll pay for your investment right there. Education's big because like I said, without getting allies on the same page, we're not going to get the equality to start focusing on increasing the home ownership rates. If people can't buy houses in every state in this country, how in the hell are we gonna expect the home ownership rate to increase? So we have a two hour proprietary course that we designed with the help of a couple different organizations, including NAR, which is focused on ally awareness. It's a LGBTQ cultural competency 101, so to speak. And at the end of this, you get a full credentialing package, um, kind of like a, a master's certificate, if you will, uh, as well as marketing that you're able to use on all of your branding if you so choose, and uh, one of these cool little pins over here, um, to show that you took the time to go through and understand what pronouns mean. What do all these terms that my kids are talking about mean? How does that relate to how I'm showing a home if it's a straight couple versus two women that are coming into the home? We dive into all of that as well as take about 45 minutes to talk about our attendees' experience. And our attendees are 95% straight folks that are in these audiences, which what it's made for. Um, to break down barriers and answer some questions that folks don't want to ask in public. Just like any other segment or any other walk of life, our experiences are our own, right? So my experience with something could be, I mean, very different than another gay white man in the North's experience, right? But we want to at least provide a foundation. Well, I, uh, <clears throat> I just heard about this at the back table yeah. you shared with me. And uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna commit to hosting a, a training, uh, Main Street Organization of Realtors. I don't know if they're in here yet, but I'll, I'll commit, we'll get a date together where we'll give you guys plenty of time. So if anybody's interested in uh, 
this uh, I, I think it's great. Thank you. Yeah, Thank appreciate you it. Much. Let's hear it for Ryan.